college football news coming at you and this exciting update as the Big Ten makes it official and they're on their way and already have formed the first of what are going to be three super conferences as we work our way over the next couple of years in college football in the NCAA uh, Division One landscape as the Big Ten will be one super conference, the SEC will be another super conference, and then they're going to take the best of, I think, the Big 12 and the ACC and form them together along with plucking in a few other high-powered teams from lesser conferences that are going to dissolve to form the third major super conference. And you're going to essentially have three super conferences of a minimum of 18 teams in each of these conferences. And then I think they're going to take uh, what's left of the Big 12, what's left of the Pac-12 teams that haven't realigned with other conferences, uh, t uh, teams like the uh, left-out ACC teams, uh, I think they're going to form what you're going to have the group of uh, one big conference with them of all the secondary teams and tier programs that nobody wants. But it's breaking news. The Big Ten has formed officially now an 18-team super conference after adding USC and UCLA last year. And they've just plucked out uh, Oregon and Washington uh, just a couple of days ago. And that's going to change the whole landscape of the conference in the Big Ten, obviously, and of the college football as they make it official. I think we're going to be on our way over the next five or six years, upping it from a 14 playoff like we just did to a 12 team playoff. I think we're going to eventually have to go to a 24 team playoff when you have three super conferences. You're going to need more playoff games. They're aligning it to get more playoff games. And that's where the money is with the extra playoff games. If you up it from 12 to 24, you could have. Uh, three or four teams from each of the super conferences, or maybe five teams make it, as you have Oklahoma and Texas joining the SEC next year, joining a conference with perennial powers of Alabama, Auburn, right? And now you're going to have Texas and Oklahoma there, Georgia, obviously the king of the SEC and the king of college football now. And I think it's going to be more of a, it's going to be a little bit troubling for some of these programs to actually adjust into these new conferences that have more of a physical power, intimidating brand of football on the offensive and defensive lines. Like when you get UCLA, USC, uh, Oregon, and Washington, I think honestly UCLA has the history of having big offensive lines or more so where they have offensive and defensive lines that can more stack up when they're good with the big time. I think Lincoln Riley and USC decides when Pete Carroll was there and they had a big physical running backs and offensive lines imposing safeties and bullies up front on the defensive front. Uh, USC and Lincoln Riley's pedigree coming from Oklahoma is they're historically a run and shoot offense, a run and shoot program. And Lincoln Riley has never uh, been real tuned on his defense. And as we took out, as we go look at some of these defensive stats here in a minute, uh, USC, I think it's going to have problems along with Oregon, even though they both have innovative, explosive offenses. When it comes down to winning the Big Ten, when it comes down to winning the national championship, you have to play some defense. And when you get into uh, uh, October and November and you're playing in Madison, you're playing in Ann Arbor, you're going to the most hostile environment in the Big Ten and maybe college football at Penn State, going to Columbus, Michigan State, Northwestern, Nebraska, it's cold, it's windy, it's snowing, it's raining, it's miserable field conditions, and yet it's when you have to be able to run the ball and you have to play defense or you start getting exposed if you can't do that and it causes problems and the numbers and the and the things uh, USC and Oregon and UCLA to an extent when they've been good, which they haven't been that good over the last 15 years, is uh, when you get into the big, nitty-gritty, cold, windy, snowy, horrible field conditions, if you can't run the football in the Big Ten, if you can't physically match your opponent up front on both sides of the lines, you're in a hole, you're at a disadvantage, and usually... Uh, you don't come out on top, but they've been living the life of the non-existent defense in the Pac-12 where they can just throw the ball over the field, spread their wide receivers out, get some athletic, fast running backs, and uh, chop the holes up the middle. Uh, but they don't really play any sort of defense. They play even worse defense or as bad as what uh, the Big 12 was, right? They don't play defense.
And I think that's going to be a huge thing for USC and a huge thing for Oregon. If they think they're going to come into the Big Ten and dominate the conference, I think they're going to get hit in the mouth and hit in the mouth quick and fast. Their first trip out east of the Mississippi to Wisconsin, to Michigan, to Ohio State, at Penn State, Michigan State, and now an up-and-coming Nebraska team. They all pride themselves on big physical offensive lines and defensive lines, and they spit out. NFL players at the offensive and defensive lines like clockwork in Ann Arbor, like clockwork in Columbus, like clockwork in Penn State, and up in Wisconsin with Luke Fickle there now as their new head coach. I think they're going to innovate that offense a little bit, and I think it's going to be kind of a shock to the system when those four schools come into the Big Ten and they think they don't have to change. They're going to have to adapt or they're going to be knocked down a peg in USC's case and Oregon's case. Uh, if they think they're going to be able to come into the Big Ten and run that same style of non-existent defense with small up-front play, undersized offensive and defensive lines, not playing a physical brand of football, and you're seeing that at Ohio State now, when the offense looks similar to what Urban Meyer was running, but the one keen big difference is Urban Meyer ran a power spread running game. They were big, physical, up-front on the offensive line, Big, nasty defensive linemen and fast, uh, shifty, but powerful physical running backs that Urban Meyer uh, had. And that's one of the reasons he went on that one of the best, if not the best, uh, tenures in Ohio State history with that national championship that he did win is because he was... He had the dirtiest, nastiest, most physical, big, imposing offensive and defensive lines in the Big Ten his entire tender. And that's the one thing that I've noticed that's changed with Ryan Day now coming into his fifth season, I believe, taking over for Urban Myers. All those guys are gone. And the running backs, even though they're skilled, the wide receivers are top-notch and maybe best in the country for the third straight year. That offensive and defensive line, like you looked at in the Michigan game the last couple of years, Ohio State was bullied, Ohio State was pushed off the line, and Ohio State was physically dominated and worn down as the game went on. And they could not match, they could not push Michigan's offensive line, they could not protect uh, Michigan's defensive line from pushing them into the backfield. And as it turned out, Michigan sacks the quarterback. Michigan disrupts what they want to do. And on the other side of that, Ohio State wasn't able to stop the Michigan running game because that big physical uh, offensive line that was the best offensive line two years in a row, and it's going to be three years in a row this year because Jim Harbaugh, just like uh, up in Wisconsin and just like at Penn State and used to be at Ohio State with Urban Meyer, they breed themselves they're, they have to take pride in the big physical offensive lines. But you can see the Big Ten president, chancellors, voted unanimously today to admit the University of Oregon and the University of Washington to the Big Ten Conference effective August 2nd, 2024, to com uh, competition to begin sports in the 2024-2025 academic year, which means next year with the school, uh, Oregon and Washington will also join the Big Ten Academic Alliance, the BTAA. I'm thrilled that the University of Oregon has apparent has the opportunity to join the nation's uh, prominent academic conference, blah, 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 blah. The Big Ten is thriving conference, and it's all about money. It's all about the revenue. And these guys, these teams, USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington, are going to make a boatload more money joining the Big Ten. And the Big Ten getting major media markets like Los Angeles, uh, Oregon, and with Washington, but specifically uh, UCLA and USC with the Los Angeles TV market, it's gonna, it's a win-win for both, right? High for their best teams out there. They didn't take like when they took Rutgers and Maryland. I really didn't like, but they wanted to get into the DC and the Mid Atlantic uh, marketplace. So I got why they did it. They took bottom feeders from other conferences, and as such, those schools haven't really done anything in the Big Ten. But now adding those four teams, they plucked the best four teams out of that conference with the four biggest markets and the two biggest that share the same city, right? Accepting memberships into the big time conference is transforming opportunity for the University of Oregon. Uh, change the short and long term trajectory of the university. We have tremendous respect for uh, the gratitude for the Pac-12. It's tradition, history, blah, blah, blah. The big time history of athletics and academic success is long term stability, uh, best position of our team and the future success. What he's really trying to say there is they have uh, their conference is going to be uh, one of the three super conferences and it's going to ensure their history. It's going to ensure their uh, money and uh, 
their revenue source and it's going to continue to increase and it's a substantial revenue increase for these four teams that are joining the University of Washington, the University of Oregon, the USC Trojans and the UCLA Bruins, right? And you look at the big physical play and how you have to win and why I'm saying Washington, Oregon, UCLA and USC, especially Lincoln Riley, if he has national championship aspirations coming into the Big Ten, they're going to have to change the way their mindset is and change the way that they approach the game. Because look at the top defensive stats last year. You got Iowa, you got Illinois, you got Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio State, right, all in the top 15 they're all big, physical, even though Iowa can't score the ball, Iowa wins a lot of games because they can bully you up front. They're fundamentally sound, and they're big and physical on both sides of the ball, and they can handle any offensive and defensive line in the country. Whenever they play, they can stack up, right? Their skill position players, their offensive philosophy, and their quarterback play, they cannot, and that is what hinders them. And when they play better teams, they usually lose because – their defense can only keep you in the game for so long, and their offensive line can only do so much when they don't have wide receivers, when they don't have uh, a quarterback that can uh, do and throw the ball down the football field to wide receivers and extend the field and back up the defense. But you notice you don't see any Big 12 teams or any uh, Pac-12 teams in the top 15, and you got four, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, and Iowa, all in the top 15, right? And then you got Penn State, another team that prides themselves. They used to be linebacker U. They kind of still are. They have big physical teams every year. But you scroll down this list, and let's look. As we scroll, continue scrolling down here, let's try to find the first uh, new one of these teams that have cracked the defensive statistics. And we got to go all the way to page two to try to find uh, one of these teams, right? And this isn't just one bad year for these teams. There you go. Washington is the first team to check in at number 60th ranked in the country last year, uh, giving up five and a half yards a play, gave up 40 offensive touchdowns. They got 40 offensive touchdowns, and uh, they gave up 36 or 42 touchdowns last year at an average of 372 uh, yards per game against them. That is not a very good defense. And this isn't just one year for these teams. This is every year. This is how they play football out there, right? And we keep scrolling down the list. Here comes Oregon checking in at 71. Gave up 381.2 yards and 43 touchdowns last year. Nearly six yards a pop. That is not going to get the job done in the Big Ten. And these teams are going to have to fundamentally and philosophically change some of their the way they play. They're going to have to get bigger and more physical and start producing NFL linemen and NFL offensive and defensive linemen, or they're going to get bullied, and it's not going to matter how skilled you are on the outside. It's not going to matter how skilled your quarterback is. If he doesn't have time and he's not protected and he's getting harassed and he's getting uh, beaten down and thrown into the ground time and time again, you see UCLA at number 87 right here, giving up 403 yards and 5.64 yards per play is not very good and it's not going to get the job done when you're not only going up against uh, big physical teams like you are week in and week out in the Big Ten but when you play uh, in October November and it starts snowing it's very windy in the Midwest in the Great Lakes region in the fall a lot of wind a lot of games are played with snow or rain and winds at 30 40 50 miles an hour you can't air the ball all over the field all day like USC chucking at 106 in the country in total defense last year, giving up a staggering 6.53 yards per play and 429, 423.9 yards per game. That is a recipe for disaster in the Big Ten, especially late in the season, right? When you're going at Iowa, in Iowa City, you're not going to get the job done giving up six yards of play and giving up 400 yards of offense. You're not going to go week in and week out and be successful in the Big Ten. These teams are going to have to adapt. These teams are going to have to change their philosophies, and they're going to have to start beefing up their lines if they want to compete with the top of the Big Ten like Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. I believe Wisconsin's going to be up and coming with Luke Fickle there. And as always, uh, usually Michigan State is up there, but right now they're on a down cycle. But if they're going to try to win the Big Ten, if they're going to try to come into the conference like they think they are and going to boy over the league, they're going to have another thing coming. And I think the rest of the college football nation 
is going to be in for a rude awakening when you get Washington, Oregon, UCLA, and USC coming into the Big Ten and they start getting beat up. They start uh, giving up lots of points and losing physical football games when they travel east of the Mississippi if they think they're going to come into the Big Ten and they're going to you'd be able to play the same type of football that they've played out in the Pac-12 uh, for the last 50 years. It's not going to happen. These teams are going to have to adapt. And I think the Big Ten's still going to roll through Ann Arbor. I think the Big Ten's still going to uh, have to go through Columbus. And these two teams are going to have to earn their way to become the new Michigan and the new Ohio State. Remember to hit that bell notification and subscribe to the channel as we start to get into the college football season and cover all the latest highlights, breaking news, playoff predictions, uh, and any of the things that are interesting week to week. Peace and love.